Auto Line This Week is underwritten in part by... In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The Hybrid Game MPG Challenge. And now, here is your host, John McElroy. As you all know, the automotive industry has got to hit some mighty tight fuel economy standards. And that's why on AutoLine this week, we're going to be talking about how they can make cars lighter, because the lighter a car is, the better the fuel economy gets. And joining me on today's show are Carla Balo, the Senior Vice President of Research and Development for Nissan Americas. Frank Macher is the CEO of Continental Structural Plastics, also known as CSP. And Rose Rents is the Senior Director of Advanced Development for the International Automotive Components Company, also known as IAC. I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Carla, you're in charge of all the products that Nissan has for the Americas. Tell us and the audience just how important is light weighting to your efforts to improve fuel economy. Yeah, I would say at this point, you know, if you look at all the things comprehensively that we're doing to improve fuel economy, um, light weighting is going to get us to the next level. If you look at what we've done in powertrains, right now we're probably at about 80%, 90% of what we can eke out of improving the engine and plus our CVTs and efficiencies. You look at all the other loads coming into the system and, and we're about there. Aerodynamics, we're going to reduce it as much as we can, but that has its limits too. So then you're looking at we need about a 30% weight reduction over the next few years to meet the upcoming standards. Oh my gosh, 30%. 30%. And right now we've probably done five to seven. So, so we have a lot more to go. In pounds, that's what, almost a thousand pounds of vehicle? Almost, or? almost. Wow, it's that's a lot of amazing weight. Amazing amount, yes. And, and I got to tell the audience, this is an industry that fights over every gram. So exactly. to say that you're going to take out almost a thousand pounds is an enormous effort. Right, and we look at fuel economy all the way down to 0.1, 0.01 MPG when we're trying to find every element to, to hit the target. Frank, I've got to imagine for a supplier like CSP, this is a potential bonanza. Well, it is a, bon a potential bonanza, and there's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, we've been in that business, structural composites, for many years. Um, we developed uh, the first Class A outer surface skin out of uh, structural plastics and SMC, and we're the current producer of virtually all the components on the C6 and the C7 Corvette, for example. Um, one of the problems is, is that as weight demands uh, become greater, we have to come up with lighter materials than even the ones we currently have. Uh, so we have to move towards uh, hybrids, we have to look towards, obviously, carbon fiber, but there are other ways to skin the cat. And, and when you say hybrids, you're not talking about battery electric no, hybrid No, no, hybrids, cars. but uh, the use of different materials in combination in order to create a system solution that allows the vehicle to lose weight effectively and efficiently and not at an exorbitant cost. And that takes a series of uh, trade-offs to take place and to create that system related solution which might mean that in some cases you use steel. It may mean in other cases you use carbon fiber or you integrate the two together to create a solution that takes advantage of both materials, their strength, their cost, and the weight. We produce materials, we actually formulate them ourselves, we have a series of patents and we have now the ability in glass combinations to get down to aluminum. We also have the ability now to produce a number of components in underbody type structures in carbon fiber at cycle times that are achieving two minutes. A lot of discussion has been taking place about the fact that cycle times for vehicles for these carbon fibers are way too long, too expensive. We are trying to find ways to solve that problem and create more efficient solutions. And we've made a lot of inroads in the last year. And we'll want to get into some more of the details of that. But Rose, I want to get you in on this because when we talk about light weighting or look at uh, what the automakers are doing, typically it's focused on the body, aluminum doors or hoods or mm -hmm. in the structure of the, the vehicle itself, or maybe even in the powertrain using more aluminum or even magnesium or things like that. Frank touched on carbon fiber. 
But my understanding is IAC is largely a interior supplier. You've got a good story to tell in weight reduction on the interior. We do indeed. If you look at, John, the overall weight percentage of interior, it's less than 10% of the total vehicle weight. So we have to come up with very uh, unique situations where we manage not only the composites, we too work in carbon fiber, natural fiber and the like, but we look at unique solutions to also manage the acoustic properties of the interior to get weight out of those components as well. I mean, if you look at plastics, which we're very big in, there's generally about 380 pounds per vehicle. Then you start adding on the fibers that are used in the interior at 50 pounds, acoustics, which are about 75 pounds, starts adding up. Well, you, we can make a dent, certainly not the biggest dent in a vehicle, but add to the overall weight reduction that Carlos talked about. So we have some pretty unique technology that I hope we get into. Yeah. And Carla, let me come back to you, because when I hear stories like you're telling here is, oh, yeah, we got to pull a third of the weight out of a vehicle. Right. The reason vehicles are so heavy today really is because we're using the least expensive materials we can get our hands on that still do the job. So when you talk about a third of the weight coming out, all I see is the price of the car going up. Right, so that's where we have to work with our suppliers to find those innovative solutions because a lot of the, the cost is driven not only by the raw materials but also in the processes that you have to use to manufacture the different parts. So obviously we need to have the manufacturing capacity, capability, and cost alignment to make that equation work. You know, look at, at carbon fibers right now, you're looking at $70 or more. And, you know, really to make it feasible, we need it in the $10 range. Well, how are you going to do that? You have to, you have to work uh, with, the, with the suppliers. You have to find the right application. And fundamentally, we're looking at every element of the car, even a switch. If I can get a 30% weight reduction out of a switch, somehow we're, we're happy to get that. You're on your goal. Everybody's got to pull 30% out of right? Everybody has to right? pull it, yeah. And, Carla was right too in the uh, this, uh, discussion about uh, the weight, uh, the cost of carbon fiber. Aeronautic uh, carbon fiber runs seventy, eighty dollars a pound, and the cost of processing to achieve that high quality uh, carbon fiber is substantial. Uh, the energy just to convert uh, polyacrylonitrile, which is the precursor that is used to create that quality of uh, carbon fiber. Um, is reduced, the actual output is reduced by more than 50% when you convert pan or polyacrylonitrile into carbon fiber. The most expensive part of the whole process though is the energy that is consumed in conversion because you have to take this pan and you uh, put it in an inert atmosphere, nitrogen, and you take it to, what is it, 2,000 degrees roughly uh, for a substantial amount of time. So there's a tremendous amount of electrical energy consumed in the manufacture of that carbon fiber. To get to a more affordable offering will require substantial changes in the precursor one, but also the extent to which we have to use the energy uh, to convert that uh, precursor to carbon fiber. In addition, we have to figure out a way to take that carbon fiber and make usable parts with processes that are as efficient as we can with a metal stamping or with a die casting or some other conventional process. So there's a huge challenge ahead. My belief is that we should, of course, continue to study exterior components for carbon fiber, but I think there's a bigger bang that we could do in the short run by looking at inner, inner panels, uh, door inners, uh, hood inners, uh, deck lid inners where the uh, actual surface finish isn't so important. Okay. And then work on the adhesive so we now take conventional technology on the outer surface, carbon fiber technology on the inner surface, marry them together and find a way to save money and weight now as opposed to waiting till we solve all these major issues with fit finish and all the other things you have to look at if it's an exterior part. So that's one of the thrusts we're taking to try to get there first. Mm -hmm. And Frank, I think it's relatively important when you look at, we also, as I said, work in carbon fiber composites. Uh, we do it for a couple different reasons, and I'll talk about price in a minute, but um, one of the reasons is it has a different safety impact on the vehicle. So when you put fibers like that and it becomes a crush zone as opposed to shattering with typical things like glass. Mm -hmm. So from a safety side, it's better, certainly from a weight side, and to get the price down or the cost down, we're actually looking at recycled 
carbon fiber that comes from places like Boeing, et cetera. And you so wonder you're what, using their scrap. We are using their scrap. And it's a perfect opportunity. I mean, we have a lot of um, compression molded type um, materials, products, where it's a perfect application. Actually, um, uh, we're on the same page there because we both are using that application. Mm -hmm. uh, I just visited one of the sources that has the uh, patents. I was aware that mm -hmm. you're also using it. And uh, uh, it's one of the areas where I believe we can achieve recycling. Uh, we have to make sure the sources of the recycled material are sustainable over time, but at least today, because demand is not so great in the second uh, dairy markets, whatever scrap is generated by the aeronautics end of the business has no place to go today except landfill. If we're able to convert that mm -hmm. into a product that has superior properties and we can recycle it for far less than what it costs uh, in the virgin state, we've hit a home run. So that's what we're working on too. So we're on the same page there for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's extremely critical that we hit these cost targets because we really have a doubt if the, uh, we really don't think that the customer's gonna be willing to pay. Mm -hmm. We can't charge more to reduce the weight of the product to get the fuel economy where the customer simply expects it to be. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's why you know we have to continue to drive for these efficiencies. Now, BMW, uh, I, I met with BMW on that same topic uh, in Munich uh, a few weeks back. And as you know, they're doing the I-3 and the I-8 with a substantial amount of carbon fiber. Their, their position is that they will use carbon fiber judiciously. And they look at every decision on a system basis. So if, for example, on the I-3, if they are able to use enough carbon fiber to reduce the weight substantially, maybe they can downsize the brakes, maybe they can downsize the um, battery system, mm -hmm. and offset to some extent the cost of the carbon fiber in the total system review. So um, there are ways to, to uh, mitigate some of the cost. At the end of the day though, the carbon fiber itself has to come down in price over time. It just has to do that or else it's gonna be a penalty. Yeah. Carla, it's not as if the, the steel people are sitting on their hands either, though. I, it, there's all the materials uh, and all the material suppliers are really looking at ways of coming up with lighter weights. But talk a little bit with what you're doing in steel in that regard. Steel, we're probably the most advanced right now. Uh, we have developed with the steel company in Japan a 1.2 gigapascal high strength steel. Which means that, uh, super strong, Super strong. so you can use a thinner we, gauge? We, we can use a much thinner gauge. We were able to reduce a significant amount of weight in the, in the new uh, Infinity that's launching in the Q50. We were able to use that in all of the structural components, in all of the A pillars, roof rails, et cetera, where we really need the strength. And we don't need, as was said earlier, the beauty. Um, although the parts themselves, we had to have a very special manufacturing process. We were able to do it through a cold form process, which is unusual for that kind of tensile strength steel. Because it's usually hot stamped? Correct. So if you're Correct. going cold, I gotta believe it's cheaper. It's, uh, it's quite a bit cheaper, and that technology is coming to our, our local suppliers here. We expect it here by, by summertime, and we're gonna expand that uh, application to many other products. But not only that, there is aluminum, of course. There's aluminum hoods now. Um, we're looking at uh, aluminum, uh, making other components out of aluminum. You know, our, our competitor Ford said they're making the whole next truck aluminum, which is really quite amazing. Uh, That's a big step. It's a huge step. Also, there's uh, glass reinforced polymeric materials that we're using already in the Murano back door and other products. We can't limit ourselves to one technology. If you do that, you will never find a one size fits all or have an optimized package. Mm -hmm. That's Additionally, true. there's wiring. Wiring is a huge impact in a car right now. The it's all of copper, weight. it's very heavy. Very heavy, and there are many suppliers now looking at alternative, you know, aluminum wiring, et cetera, that has almost the same conductivity but can really reduce the weight. Mm -hmm. Rose, give us some examples of where you can take weight out of the interior. And uh, in fact, you have 30% lighter switches. That's what Carla's looking for. <laughs> well, you know, some of the uh, most recent things we're looking at, I mentioned acoustics early on. Uh, if you look at the amount of what we call soft trim products, you could talk about the carpet area, but generally under carpet, there's a noise absorbing uh, layer that's generally very heavy because it's based on heavy filler type materials. Uh, so what we have done is we've um, 
uh, kind of gone toward what we call a silent solution that takes that heavy filler to a certain percentage, puts in other fibers or ceramics. We're able to not only thin down that material, so to get up to 30 to 50 percent weight safe, but we're able to get better acoustical properties with it so we can manage with one tool the different harmonics that you'll see in different drivetrains. So if you go from a hybrid to a combustion engine, et cetera, we're able to manage that all in one tool by the type of technology and process that we're you know, innovating as we speak. So a lot of weight. For example, to take an 18-pound uh, dash insulator, which goes between the firewall engine and the interior component, uh, we've been able to take that from 18 down to 6. So pretty amazing. So lighter, stronger, better, For cheaper sure. too, or no? It all depends. I mean, that's a typical, <laughs> typical accountant answer, right? Yeah, it really right. depends on the design of the part. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty typical across all automotive. Frank, uh, you recently came into CSP, taking that thing yes. over. My understanding is you're bringing in PhDs and you're trying to work at the stuff at a molecular level. Yes, we are. And explain some of your efforts there. Well, one of the things that uh, a challenge is the uh, uh, carbon fiber itself. And we believe me, we're working more in other areas uh, as well. But carbon fiber itself has a uh, tendency to be narcissistic. I think I mentioned that before. But uh, it doesn't like anything but itself. Uh, and it really likes itself. And so... Uh, you mean in, in trying to join these materials yeah, together? Yeah, so when you, when you take uh, carbon fiber and you try to disperse it in some formulation that includes polymers and other fillers, it tends to want a, a clump or stay with its, its own kind as opposed to dispersing and marrying other uh, polymers or other um, fillers. Um, so the challenge is what do you try to do to make that carbon fiber uh, enjoy and become flirtatious with many of the other materials within the compounds. Uh, what we've found is that uh, by activating the surface uh, as a part of a much more extensive process, but by activating the surface with things such as cold plasma uh, or with uh, uh, SQ, which is uh, sil sesquioxane, but it's a coating that we can put on that actually allows the fibers to split apart a bit and then to take on other chemicals within the compound. Why is that important? Because carbon fiber, in order for it to produce or to perform at the highest level of strength, requires complete wet out. The coating has, the carbon fiber has to be coated with the polymer. Any gap in the two will create a point of weakness that in certain structural components would make it less than satisfactory. So we've done a lot of work on that, have uh, developed a series of uh, patents, uh, and we've had great success. Now what we're trying to do is add the carbon fiber in sheet molding compound to create underbody parts that we can utilize at less cost than what is currently being employed. We're combining it, when I talk about hybrids, we're combining the carbon fiber with glass bubbles or spheres, which give us the opportunity to reduce the weight without necessarily using only carbon fiber, the most uh, expensive part. So we're doing a series of blending. It's almost like we're, um, uh, we're love making uh, in materials, but we're also uh, developing new recipes as a master chef. So um, we love to mess around with these things. Uh, my chemists uh, uh, boggle my mind every day. <laughs> but the nice part about all of what we're doing is we are making progress and we are getting closer to an affordable solution. Very interesting how you can manipulate these materials at the molecular level. That's just fascinating. It, it is, and you can see it. Uh, we have a scanning electron microscope where we will pre uh, prepare samples and review them at different points in the process to see just how extensively we have activated the surface. So it's really exciting stuff, and we're trying to do correlations now to find out just how much activation is required in order to assure us of 100% wet out. Mm -hmm. And John, um, from just to launch off what Frank said, we're doing much the same, but you mentioned glass spheres. Uh, we're looking not, at uh, not only the carbon fibers, but also natural fibers. I mentioned earlier as well that when you look at fiber reinforcement versus glass reinforcement, you get a different kind of impact behavior. And Frank's exactly right when you look at the overall impact and how it's integrally managed in that fiber. We've been able to take natural fibers and carbon fibers and get up to a 35 to 50% weight reduction in things like door bolsters, 
side impact panels on doors, and equivalent cost. So manipulating that technology at the molecular level, or the fiber level, if you may, will give you the same kind of performance at cost equal and improved performance. Carla, I gotta believe all this stuff with the materials is fascinating, and that's going to really produce breakthrough kind of uh, improvements in reducing weight. But I gotta believe it really starts with the core engineering too. How you design a car, uh, just in, in the sections where different parts of the car come together, I gotta believe th that's a big focus of yours right now as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, initially when we start you know, the whole planning process, you know, we decide very early, you know, based on the fuel economy target, what each part has to deliver. And, and what kind of aerodynamics we need, what kind of you know, powertrain performance we need. Everything is very clear. And as we begin to look at the different materials and how they're going to, to interact, then we have to start thinking about, really, is this material sufficient for this? Can it be formed this way? If it can't be formed this way and we need it for a weight reduction, then we have to change the styling or change how the basic structure works and think about how those different loads can be transferred. So it really starts very early, all by computer, all by computer modeling. And that's where we really put together which materials are gonna do the, the best job considering the application. Magnesium IPs, magnesium you know, front end modules, all of these things you have to take into account then how they're gonna deform the various safety elements all of this has to be studied and, and, and analyzed very carefully. I've heard one thing too that can help is going with structural adhesives, not just welding. Because when you have a, a big robot welder come in, you have to design a big clearance for very that true. arm to get in there. Very Whereas true. if you're just literally gluing it together, so the structural adhesive people hate using that term. Mm -hmm. But now you can design your sections for more lightweight because you don't have to worry about the true. robots That's as much. That's very, very true. And it just, again, has to be the right application because uh, gluing or, or structural adhesing you know, parts together, yes, it works in many applications, but in some, areas you really still need good old-fashioned welding you know of course so you really have to be careful but I expect to see more and more breakthroughs as we continue to test and learn more uh, we're all in a learning phase together and uh, you know the developments are progressing on a daily basis and you, so you said you had to take a thousand pounds out of your vehicles on average by what time frame that's uh, by, you know, we're looking at 20, 25, 20, 30. Okay. So you so got we, a, a, over a decade. We have some time, but that's not much in, in automotive That's years. only a few design cycles. Yeah, yeah, only a couple cars from now. So we really need to start seeing those breakthroughs and, and heading in that direction right now. Okay, so let's ask for the outside. Do you think they can pull this off? I think they can pull it off. Um, the biggest challenge for me is to understand the availability of some of these exotic materials over time. Um, right now there's an abundance of supply, but if we have the breakthroughs that I think will occur, then the question is, will there be an adequate capacity given aero, aerospace has a part of it. Uh, BMW, as you know, is linked with SGL and, and Ford has linked with Dow, uh, AXA in terms of carbon fiber, and you could go right through the various uh, groups and see that there's linkages taking place. To, to take and capture that part of the supply of the carbon fiber base. The extent to which others grow is going to be dependent on uh, when these developments occur and whether there's enough time when that step function takes place. Let's say we have a aha, a home run, and everybody go, jumps on board at one point. It, there will be a long period of time because the, uh, the um, capital expenditures for carbon fiber are very, very expensive and have very long lead times. W what we're trying to do in order to make uh, the, cus the customers uh, more aware is developing production type tooling for specific applications and we have one that we're gonna offer uh, to an OE very uh, soon that incorporates a uh, outer hood and with glass spheres and an inner of carbon fiber uh, made uh, with maybe some of this recycled material to reduce the cost and give a almost 60 percent reduction in weight. So if we can get some of these inroads so that they're being evaluated 
and then we show proof of principle, maybe we don't have to accelerate this quite so soon because of the fact that we have more time. Gotcha. Rose, we're down to the very end here. Quick, you think the, the industry will be able to pull this thousand pounds out? Absolutely. I think, yeah, back to that question, yes, I think it can get there, but I think there's a lot of ancillary things that need to be done. Joining, right, manufacturability. And don't forget the most important or one of the most important. Legislation is going to make us get there. So if you look at the CO2 or uh, carbon footprint requirements in 2020, 2025, we certainly have to get there. And it's a global thing, not just in Indeed. the U.S. market. Absolutely. Rose Rince, thanks so much for coming in. Frank Mocker, you too. Carla Bela, just a very interesting discussion about how we're going to make vehicles lighter to get better fuel economy. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you for having tuned into AutoLine this week. And please join us again here next week. Auto Line This Week is underwritten in part by... In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The Hybrid Game MPG Challenge.